Yes. The solution which the Essene offered for economic and social harmony can be applied in every age, the present as well as the past. It contained four factors. One, separating from the chaotic conditions of the mass of mankind which refuses to obey natural and cosmic law. Number two, demonstrating a practical social system based on natural and cosmic law. Number three, communicating these ideas to the outside world through teaching, healing, and helping others according to their needs. And number four, according to their communities, or sorry, attracting to their communities other individuals who are sufficiently evolved to be willing to cooperate with the law. You're listening to the Vanu Podcast, the podcast making you invulnerable to the coercion of the state and the servile society. Visit our website for free resources to aid you in your pursuit of self-liberation. Old Vanu publications, podcasts, guest articles, and much more. Go to vanupodcast.com. And now, your hosts, Shane and Jason. Twenty twenty has been a year of change for a lot of folks, including yours truly. Homestead really kicked off. I began a number of new promising lines of research. Uh, the Free Republic of Pasadena was born, and I don't think I'm an atheist anymore. Uh, certainly doesn't mean I found religion, as I do still see that institution to be a tool of control. In addition to being another reason why modern society disregards these spiritual teachings as mystical and irrelevant in favor of coercion and uh, rampant materialism, uh, when in reality, at the cores of most major religions, and with brilliant simplicity. These philosophies explain how human beings should interact with each other and with Earth and what punishments are to come when, uh, when this natural law is violated. Some call it karma, others call it cause and effect. Of course, these teachings are shrouded in all sorts of biblical allegory and I would presume some propaganda, so they aren't always at the focus or the forefront. But as is the case with most truths I've discovered, like someone with carbohydrate intolerance, type 1 diabetes, should probably largely avoid carbohydrates, these principles can be and are literally explained to kindergarten age children in Sunday school. And to those few who cringe at this mention of religion, I'm with you. I'm with you. Uh, don't worry, this episode will be relevant regardless of your religious and spiritual beliefs, or if you don't even believe that Jesus and these other teachers existed. It's fine. Uh, just as I've done some case studies on other examples of second realms, it appears they can be found in ancient times, and uh, that the nature of man really hasn't changed. That regardless of the age, technological status, etc., when man turns his back to nature and attempts to become God himself, hell breaks out on earth, and it becomes dangerous for anyone trying to live in accordance with this natural law, requiring the building of parallel societies for survival and for the propagation of freedom uh, into the future. So in one sense, this will be just another episode of the Vani podcast on the building of second realms just today. This familiar strategy will be coated with some religious overtones, and for some that may be that may be frustrating, uh, but please bear with me. Uh, the plan for today's discussion is as follows. I will begin with a brief uh, history on the Essene. Uh, then we'll uh, cover some selected quotes from the Son of God, the mystical teachings of the Masters, a uh, full source citation coming momentarily. Uh, we'll uh, cover an introduction and brief history to another book uh, or topic, the teachings of the Essene from Enoch to the Dead Sea Scrolls, and uh, lastly, uh, lastly, I think, uh, we'll see, I don't have this entire discussion planned yet, but uh, lastly, we'll cover some selected quotes from Enoch to the Dead Sea Scrolls. And uh, let me emphasize again, as far as the facts, details, etc., please take them with a grain of salt. Some of this can probably never verifiably be proven in a satisfactory manner, uh, but the philosophy and strategy is sound anyway. Uh, so let's get into it. Uh, the text I'm reading from today is uh, entitled The Son of God, The Mystical Teachings of the Masters, and uh, the sub, I guess uh, the subtitle, giving a short sketch of the early life of Jesus and of his training by the Essenian order, and an, an interpretation of some of his teachings in harmony with the fundamental principles of the Temple of Illumination, known as the Christic Interpretation, um, by R. Swinburne. Climber, uh, the philosophical publishing company, Allentown, Pennsylvania, for the Order of the Illuminati, uh, the Temple of the Illuminati, as they call themselves. Uh, and this was originally published in 1906, uh, and I'll put a link to that in, uh, in the show notes. At the time of the birth of Jesus, there were three orders among the Jews. They were very similar in their organization, but there was a difference in their teachings. These sects or organizations were the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the Essenes. We will speak first of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Both the Pharisees and the Sadducees were cordially united in sentiment, respecting all those fundamental points which constituted the basis of the Jewish religion. All of them rejected, with detestation, the notion of a plurality of gods. 
They acknowledged the existence of but one almighty God, or power, whom they regarded as the creator of the universe, and whom they believed to be endowed with the most absolute perfection. In this belief, the Essene also shared. Both sects were equally agreed in the opinion that God had selected the Hebrews from among all other nations of the earth as his peculiar people, and had bound them to himself by an unchangeable and everlasting covenant. With the same unanimity, they maintained the divine mission of Moses, that he was the ambassador of heaven, and consequently that the law delivered at Mount Sinai and promulgated by his ministry was of divine origin. It was also the general belief among both sects that in the books of the Old Testament were contained ample instructions respecting the way of salvation and internal happiness, and that whatever principles or duties were inculcated in these writings must be reverently received and implicitly obeyed. But an almost irreconcilable difference of opinion, and the most vehement disputes prevailed among them respecting the original source or fountain whence all religion was to be deduced. The Sadducees rejected with disdain the oral law, to which the Pharisees paid the greatest deference, and the interpretation of the written law yielded still further ground for acrimonious contention. The Pharisees maintained that the law as committed to writing by Moses, and likewise every other part of the sacred volumes, had a twofold sense or meaning, the one plain and obvious to every reader, and the other abstruse and mystical. This is also a fundamental belief of the Essene, and is to this day of the successors of the Essene, the Rosicrucian Fraternity. The Sadducees, on the contrary, would admit of nothing beyond a simpler interpretation of the words according to their strict literal sense. The Essene, however, differed somewhat from both in this. First, they considered the words of the law to possess no force or power whatever in themselves, but merely to exhibit the shadows or the images of celestial objects, of virtues, and of duties. Second, they regarded that salvation could not come by mere faith in the law, but by doing as the law commanded. In point of number, riches, authority, and influence, the Pharisees took precedence of all Jewish sects, and as they constantly manifested an extraordinary display of religion, an apparent zeal for the cultivation of piety and brotherly love, and by an affectation of superior sanctity in their opinions, manners, and dress, the influence that they possessed over the minds of the people was unbounded, insomuch that it may almost be said that they gave whatever direction they pleased to public affairs. It is unquestionable, however, that the religion of the Pharisees, for the most part, was founded in consummate hypocrisy, and that in reality they were generally the slaves of every vicious appetite, proud, arrogant, and avaricious, consulting only the gratification of their lusts, even at the moment of their professing to be engaged in the service of their master. And to uh, step away from the text real quick, uh, that is parallel number one. These odious features and the character of the Pharisees drew upon them the most pointed rebukes from Jesus. With more severity indeed than he bestowed on the Sadducees who, although they had departed widely from genuine principles of religion, yet did not impose themselves upon mankind by a pretended sanctity or devote themselves with insatiable greediness to the acquisition of honors and riches. The Pharisees admitted their immortality of the soul, the resurrection of the body, and a future state of rewards and punishments. They admitted, to a certain extent, the free agency of man, but beyond that, they supposed his actions to be controlled by the decree of fate. These points of doctrine, however, seem to not have been understood or explained by the sects in the same way, neither does it appear that either of the two took any great pains to define and to ascertain them with accuracy and precision, or to support them by reasoning and argument. The Sadducees were a sect much inferior in point of number to that of the Pharisees, but composed entirely of persons distinguished for their opulence and prosperity. Those who belonged to them were wholly devoid of the sentiments of benevolence and compassion towards others, whereas the Pharisees, according to authority, were ever ready to relieve the wants of the needy and the afflicted. The Sadducees were fond of passing their lives in one uninterrupted course of ease and pleasure, insomuch that it was with difficulty they could be prevailed on to undertake the duties of the magistracy or any other public function. Their leading tenet was that all our hopes and fears terminate with the present life, the soul being involved in one common fate with the body, and like it, liable to perish and be annihilated. Upon this principle, it was natural for the Sadducees to maintain that obedience to the divine law would be rewarded by the Most High, with length of days and an abundance of the good things of this life, such as honors, distinctions, and riches. Well, the violators of it, in like manner, would find their punishment in the temporary sufferings and afflictions of the present time. Therefore, they always connected the favor of heaven with a state of worldly prosperity, and could not regard any as virtuous, or the friends of heaven, except the fortunate and the happy. They had no bowels of compassion for the poor and the miserable. Their desires and hopes centered in a life of pleasure, leisure, ease, and voluptuous gratifications." 
This is precisely the character that reliable authority gives them. Also, this idea appears to be countenanced by the sacred writings, especially if, as is now generally admitted, the Master Jesus, in the parable of the rich man and Lazarus, designed in the person of the former to delineate the principles and manners of life of a seducee. Although not mentioned openly in the Bible for the reason that Jesus was one of them, the Essene existed as a sect in the time of Jesus and were divided into, into two branches. The one was characterized by a life of celibacy dedicated to the instruction and education of the children of others, while the other branch, the Therapeutae, thought it proper to marry, not with a view of sensual gratification, but for the purpose of propagating the human species, and for the purpose of the development of a certain power which is possible only through the rites of true marriage. Hence they were distinguished by the people as the practical and the theoretical scene. The scene were distributed in the cities and throughout the countries of Syria, Palestine, and Egypt. In fact, they were all the natural successors to the Egyptian initiates after the fall of the Temple of Initiation in Egypt. Their bond of association embraced not merely a community of tenants and similarity of manners and particular observances, but extended also to an inter-community of goods. Their demeanor was sober and chaste, and their mode of life in every respect was subjected to the strictest regulations and was submitted to the superintendents of governors, whom they appointed over themselves, and whom held such position for life. In like manner, the governor, now known as the Grand Master, is at the head of the Rosicrucian fraternity in each country for life. The whole of their time was devoted to labor, meditation, and prayer. And they were most sedulously attentive to the calls of justice and humanity, and of every moral duty. They believed in the unity of God, were the one supreme being, with principalities and hierarchies less than the one supreme God. They believed the soul to have fallen, through disobedience to the divine law, from the regions of purity and light into the dark bodies which men occupy at the house of the soul. They considered men, during their continuance in the body, to be confined, as it were, within the walls of loathsome prisons, which had to be changed into the temples of God through obedience to the divine law. They cultivated great absence, allowing themselves but little bodily nourishment or gratification. The ceremonies and rituals, or external forms, which were enjoined by the laws of Moses to be observed in the worship of God, were not regarded by the Essenes as necessary, except as symbolizing the greater worship within the temple of man. Like the old initiates of Egypt, they held that the ritualistic form or ceremony should not be held by the neophytes until after they had manifested interior initiation. The experience of initiation, the temple of the Illuminati, calls individualized soul consciousness, and the Rosicrucian fraternity calls it passing the threshold. This same form is today observed by the Rosicrucian's fraternity, as also by the temple of the Illuminati, which is the outer court of the Rosicrucian fraternity, as was the Therapeutae, an outer circle of the Essene. No neophyte can take part in the ceremonial ritual through until, through training, not mere study, he has passed the threshold and has found the Christ, or reached soul consciousness. In accordance with the teachings of the Essene, of Jesus, and of the Rosicrucian fraternity, even the ceremonial initiation is not actually required, but it helps to bind its initiates into a closer bond of brotherhood, and that it brings them together, and symbolizing outwardly that which they have already found within themselves. Only sacrifices of incense were offered by the Essene, but this they did in their homes. Although Jesus often denounced both the Pharisees and the Sadducees most bitterly, there is not a single instance of his having anything to say against the Essene, and this alone is evidence that, even if he had not been one of them, he must have agreed with their doctrine and have found nothing against them. But there is manuscript proof in abundance that he received his whole training in their temples, both in Palestine and in Egypt. All right, I'm not going to read all of this, uh, so I'm going to skip forward a touch, uh, and, and this has to do with the, the history of the scene, and it will also uh, very, very upfront tell you exactly what we're going to talk about today, and why this is extremely relevant to Vani, why it's extremely relevant to building second realms, um, and why it's another historical case study, uh, whether we're talking about... Uh, um, whether we're talking about uh, Rayo's wilderness Vani out in the Siskiyou National Forest, or if we're talking about the Essene on a coastal city in Palestine or somewhere. And this is, uh, uh, let me see, uh, okay, so, quote, They serve God, said Philo, with great piety, not by offering victims, but by sanctifying the spirit. Avoiding towns, they devote themselves to the arts of peace. Not a single slave is to be found among them. They are all free and work for one another. They were the only ones that taught man that he must and could be perfect, even as the Father in heaven is perfect. And this was the constant teaching of Jesus to humanity. 
Uh, continuing forward uh, to uh, a later page, uh, quote, the Essene were of an exemplary morality. They forced themselves to transmute passion and anger into benevolence, peace of mind, and power to help others. And uh, one other uh, text I will be reading from uh, briefly today is uh, the teachings of the Essene from Enoch to the Dead Sea Scrolls by Edmund Bordeaux Sezikli, uh, if that's how you even pronounce his last name. Oh, but apparently this guy is from the International Biogenic Society. And... Yeah, provide more information on this in the Dead Sea Scrolls at a, uh, a later time in this episode. But uh, for the purposes of uh, the history of the Essene and uh, also introducing a topic of discussion today, <laughs> I love it. I absolutely love it. Uh, quote, The solution which the Essene offered for economic and social harmony can be applied in every age, the present as well as the past. It contained four factors. One, Separating from the chaotic conditions of the mass of mankind, which refuses to obey natural and cosmic law. Number two, demonstrating a practical social system based on natural and cosmic law. Number three, communicating these ideas to the outside world through teaching, healing, and helping others according to their needs. And number four, according to their communities, or sorry, attracting to their communities other individuals who are sufficiently evolved to be willing to cooperate with the law. End quote. So, yeah, number one, separating from the chaotic condition, separating from the first realm, separating from the survival society. Uh, because, yeah, they refuse to obey natural and cosmic law, and they refuse to respect property rights. So uh, we, uh, we avoid them. Uh, number two, uh, demonstrating a practical social system. So this is, uh, you know, what's talked about in second round bo second round book on strategy is that, uh, you know, these various, uh, you know, human institutions. Um, you know, one of the, one of the, ad what are the advantages of uh, building second realms? Uh, and the here and now is that we can try these things out. So Jesus and the Essene did the same thing. Uh, number three, communicating these ideas to the outside world through teaching. Um, obviously, that's, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the, the outreach, the outreach efforts, uh, trying to attract those who uh, uh, attract those of like mind. Uh, certainly, uh, certainly some overlap there. And lastly, um, yeah, kind of the, the, the same sort of idea, communicating and attracting. So, yeah, I mean, I read this and I was like, holy shit, like they're, they were literally building second realms. Um, they were literally building second realms. So uh, that should provide a, a very good uh, start to this discussion. And uh, I think as far as the history of the Essene, we'll, uh, we'll stop there for now. Now for some selected quotes. First, quote, a clear distinction should be made between blind faith and intelligent or a seeing faith, between faith that is passive and one that is active, between an inert and a living faith. Between faith in a personality and faith in a principle. Faith in Jesus and faith in the Christ. Jesus is the name of a man, a personality. The Christ is the name of the conscious, individualized, illuminated soul of Jesus. Jesus, as an historic character, lived his earth life and passed out of the, play, uh, passed out of the plane of manifestation. The Christ is a divine principle developed and individualized in Jesus, is eternal. As an illuminated soul, the Christ is immortal. Faith in Jesus as a personality merely is a blind faith. Faith in the Christ as a state of consciousness that all may attain by living the teachings of Jesus and by obeying the law of uh, love as he demonstrated is an intelligent and active faith, uh, end quote. So um, what I love here, and this is uh, just as what Paul Rosenberg talked about uh, in my interview with him, is that, uh, you know, early Christianity um, was all about um, being like Jesus, right? So, um, like, it's all about doing. Uh, it was all about doing. Uh, that's not the case today, right? Uh, you know, it's this, uh, the modern conception of, of Jesus or any of any of these, uh, you know, religious, uh, you know, religious uh, gods is that they are out of the realm of humanity, right? Like, they're, they're gods, um, and we could never, uh, you know, we could never match them, um, never match them. Um, but this is uh, just along, along the same lines as what Mark Passio talks about. So for those that, um, who, who go down this realm as well, that's when our, our thoughts, uh, emotions, and actions are all internally and externally consistent, and um, we are, uh, you, know, um, you know, love is ex the expansion of consciousness, um, whereas, uh, you know, violence or, you know, slavery is the, is a reduction of consciousness. And again, for, for those who don't like these, these words, um, just bear with me for the, for the sake of this discussion. Well, obviously, you know, when we, when we build second realms, when we build these, this, this, this culture, when we build, um, when we build this, this parallel society, um, 
we're trying, you know, it's, it's, it's all about freedom, right? It's all about freedom and autonomy. It's all about that expansion of consciousness. Um, so whether you want to call it Christ consciousness or whatever, whatever the hell you want to, whatever you want to call it, um, you know, uh, it, 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 yeah, it doesn't matter. Um, the point is, you know, in, in their sense, it was, it was more religious and spiritual. In our sense, it's more about freedom and autonomy. But um, the end result is the same as that. It lifts humanity up. It's um, the culture promotes autonomy and, you know, betterment, not uh, deterioration and destruction like the servile society does. So um, that is uh, quote number one. And uh, the second quote, uh, which uh, you've already heard, um, but uh, it's so important. We're, we're going to cover and discuss it again. Uh, quote, they serve God, said Philo, with great piety, not by offering victims, but by sanctifying the spirits. Avoiding towns, they devote themselves to, uh, to the art of arts of peace. Not a single slave is to be found among them. They're all free and work for one another. They were the only ones that taught man that he must and could be perfect, even as the Father in heaven is perfect. And this was the constant teaching of Jesus to humanity. End quote. So yeah, this this was the first. Um, I, I, will, I will say, like, I, I I became interested in this book. I, I just randomly stumbled across it online, and uh, you guys have heard some of the Bill Cooper stuff that I've been releasing lately, and I've, I've re-listened to Mystery Babylon a couple of times, and I saw this book come across, and I was like, huh, looks interesting. I'll read it. And this was the first the first part, I guess, where well, I guess the, the introduction. There's there's a lot of there's a lot of gems before this part, um, even just you know page thirty, but um, or page forty one actually, so page we're on now. But there's there's a lot of gems before it. Um, but this was the point I was like, oh my gosh, like <laughs> there might actually be something here. Like, what, what, what have I stumbled across? What, what have I stumbled into? Um, but yes, uh, I mean, the, that's the principle of the second realm, you know, free, it's, it's all about, uh, all about freedom and, uh, and uplifting. And, uh, that is, uh, seems to be, uh, seems to be the way the, uh, the Essene and, and, uh, you know, these, uh, these so-called, uh, great teachers lived. Okay, uh, the next quote, and we're gonna we're gonna continue with that theme I was talking about. What Passio has talked about uh, the internal and ex internal and er internal and external consistency, um, where our thoughts and emotions and actions are all yeah again internally and externally consistent. This is uh, page forty six. Quote: Believe, love, and act according to your belief and your love. Do deeds rest not upon mere faith, for faith without worth works is dead. Uh, the same sort of theme I've been talking about for years uh, when it comes to, to freedom is that um, you know you can talk about these things all day all damn day long. But it doesn't matter unless you act upon them, right? Um, again, the, the the necessary duality of theory and practice, um, philosophy and uh, practice, philosophy and action. Well, the the, the same sort of uh, thing is being discussed here. Like it's 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 the same principle, the the, the same principle, um, only in this in this uh, you know religious and spiritual sort of context. It's not just uh, this blind faith in Jesus, as is probably the the more modern conception today about uh, living and being like Jesus. Uh, it's about uh, that, that, uh, that so-called Christ consciousness. Next, uh, and I, I especially appreciated this, uh, this, this portion here. Uh, we're on to uh, page 55. Quote, the entire intellectual activity of man should be centered in one thing, the working out of reason, of the idea of good. Reason which enlightens life and guides our conduct is no illusion. It cannot be explained away. Follow reason illuminated by the divine light within and attain welfare, not only of the self, but of others, has always been the doctrine of all the teachers of mankind. It is the whole teaching of Jesus, uh, end quote. So, um, yeah, the importance of reason. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it seems pretty unreasonable to me to to advocate for, for peace and freedom and, and, and principles like this, and then also advocate for a uh, first state uh, or go, uh, you know, vote in a, in a political crusading election or, or, or whatever. Right. Uh, so I, I think the, the, the reason part is actually, is actually pretty important uh, because uh, insanity, uh, you know, doing the same thing over and over again, expecting a different result. Um, insanity is unreasonable. Uh, and uh, I think it kind of goes without saying that the entire servile society is pretty much unreasonable. And uh, that is uh, by, uh, by design. You know, conflict over cooperation, confusion over clarity, complexity over simplicity, etc., etc., etc. All right, uh, and these ne this next uh, longer quote, um, and whenever we get into the uh, to the to the uh, discussion on, I, and I don't know how how far we'll get into it, but uh, the Book of Enoch and uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls. Um, this is uh, kind of more more of the theme of that. It's uh, very kind of apocalyptic in nature, at least that the Book of Enoch is. Um, quote. Your iniquity, uh, so let me see here. 
Uh, this is Isaiah 59, uh, two through, uh, uh, chapter 59, verse 2 through 11. Quote, Your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you, that he will not hear. For your hands are defiled with blood and your fingers with, in, with iniquity. Your lips have spoken lies, your tongue hath muttered per, uh, perverseness. None calleth for justice, nor any ple- uh, pleadeth for truth. They trust in vanity and speak lies. They conceive mischief, but bring forth iniquity. Their works are works of iniqui- iniquity, and the act of violence is in their hands. Their feet run to evil, and they make haste to shed innocent blood. Their thoughts are thoughts of iniquity. Desolation and destruction are in their paths. The way of peace they know not, and they know th- there is no judgment in their goings. They have made themselves crooked paths. Whosoever go- uh, goeth therein shall not know peace. Therefore is judgment far from us, neither doth righteousness overtake us. We wait for light, but behold obscurity. For brightness, but we walk in the, uh, but we walk in darkness. We grope for the wall like the blind ye. Uh, we grope as they, uh, as they that have no eyes. We stumble at noonday as in the twilights. Among these that are lusty, we are as uh, dead men. Here we have the reason why man does not know his God, why he does not know that he is a son of God, and consequently, why he is a poor human weakling, the victim of fate, the slave of every passion that is capable of giving pleasure, even for a moment. End quote. So, yeah, we're going to see that uh, that theme pop up, you know, throughout freedom, truth, justice, uh, all these things. Um, again, especially in the book of Enoch, like, uh, you know, around the, the so-called, uh, you know, the Great Flood. Um, I mean, yeah, there's <laughs> society looked a lot of a lot very similar to what it looks like today. Um, <laughs> very, very similar uh, for for what it's worth. So, um, yeah, it, it's just. I don't know. I, I guess it's uh, um, in some ways further verification, right? Confirmation bias, some people would call. Um, but uh, I don't know. Anyway, I thought it was uh, thought worthy of uh, worthy of mentioning and, and bringing up here. So, all right, and a similar uh, similar uh, excerpt uh, quote. But men did not listen to these admonitions, and the destruction foretold has continued from that time on to this, and will continue until men learn to obey this command, which is a which is a divine law, and. Uh, Breaking in here real quick, really anytime they say divine law or cosmic law or whatever, I mean, I just think about it in terms of natural law because it's, it's this again, it's basically the same thing, just cloaked, uh, coded in religious overtones. Uh, so uh, back to it, quote, the time is now. Those that desire progress and regeneration must obey the law. Not, and capital L law. Again, if you listen to Passio, he makes those distinctions very, very clear. Lowercase l is man's law. Capital L is God law, divine law, natural law. Um, so this is uh, um, back to it. Those that desire progress and regeneration must obey the big L law. Not only is it necessary to have faith in the, again, capital L law, but it is necessary to live in harmony with its requirements. The millions are perishing, going toward destruction. All about us there is war. Truly the blood of the innocent is upon the hands of men. For the sake of personal ambition, a nation is warring against nation, and thousands are going down in the path in the path of deterioration, having the blood of their fellow men on their hands. Others are taking advantage of those who are still under the slaves' circumstances. Some of these are caged up underground, others in the wilderness of woods, others little children in factories unfit for the lowest beast of the field. All those who exploit these helpless ones have the blood of the innocent upon their hands and therefore cannot know their God. So, um, again, another little uh, apocalyptic uh, sort of sort of thing. But, uh, next quote here. Uh, the divine law recognizes no such thing as compulsion. And man is held responsible for what he does because he has been given free will to do or not to do. He cannot plead force, for he is given a mind with the faculty of reason. He must ask himself the question, is it right to do this? Is it right to do that? And if the answer indicates that it is not right, then he must refuse to do it. He must refuse to do it, even though he may have the li- uh, even though he may lose the life of his body, for he who loses his life shall gain it. End quote. Um, so, for me, that just harkens to what we're what we're looking at right now. You know, with with uh, all of the uh, you know the the you know the so called uh, CV nonsense is that um, the only way that this is all possible is through fear. Right. The only way that all of this tyranny and destruction is possible is through fears, through people um, going along with the orders because they are fearful um, or that, you know, they are, are, you know, or the the other arguments that you're forced to do it. You know, well, it's a law. You know, you've got to wear uh, you got to wear a mask. Right. It's a law. No, it's not a law. 
So I guess the, 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 the point here is that the only possible way for this stuff to happen is for people to be fearful and uh, to give in to the, to the coercion, to the compulsion. Um, and it's very important to keep in mind, it's what we've talked about before, you know, you're practicing security culture principles, practicing the principles of Manu that, uh, that Rayo talked about. Um, you, minimize, uh, you, you, you minimize your risk of uh, facing, uh, you know, that coercion. And um, you obviously, uh, you know, just as with ethical enclaves, you, you live according to you, know, you live according to your principles, um, and that's uh, certainly certainly a, a main staple of Anu, certainly a main staple of, of the second realm. And uh, I just think it's a really important point here that um, that's it's important for us to always as, as you know, it's, it's it's important for I guess um, for all of our actions to um, again be internally and externally consistent, um, thoughts, emotions, and actions, all of those things. So um, I just thought that was an important point, something to uh, to talk about there briefly. And again, uh, same same page, just a little a little further down. Um, and this should just kind of be obvious, right? Like I I always despise like the 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 hypocrisy, you know, America being a Christian nation, and like you know, all of the destruction, uh, you know, especially in the realm of foreign policy, um, uh, the the nice term for 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 war and destruction. Um, you know, it's 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 just all hypocrisy. It's all hypocrisy. But um, I'll just uh, read this uh, for for your benefit, real quick. Uh, quote for the for this reason, no man who knows the Father can uphold destruction of life, uh, whether guilty or not. Um, moving forward uh, a little further, uh, war is not uh, not made right simply by being sanctioned by organized society, which is called a government, but which in itself is composed of individuals who are themselves personally responsible to God, and who though combined. Uh, have no more right to sanction murder than the individual man who stands alone. So, uh, I appreciate it. It's something that us, you know, us anarchists and individualists have been talking about for, for, for you know, years, right? Uh, for years, and, and that's, uh, you know, how how can you uh, delegate rights that you don't have to somebody else? Well, you know, um, the uh, apparently the Rosicrucian, the Temple of the Illuminati, was saying uh, the same thing back in 1906. So, um. I don't know. Take that. Take that for what it's worth. Uh, I guess it's worth mentioning. Pass uh, mentioning Passio again. Uh, he's um, again like the most prominent anarchist uh, that's that's done work on this subject. Um, but uh, you know, he talks about uh, you know, light and dark occultism. Uh, so I guess this uh, could possibly be uh, that light variety. Um, I don't know. Seems like it. Seems like it. And again, it overlaps with um, with you know the, the the principles that you know principles of Anu, natural law, all those all those things. All right. So uh, next, this is uh, just a, a, a very, very uh, great quote, uh, and I'm probably going to mess up this guy's name, but Lamanus wrote, uh, wrote thus: "Quote towards the close of his mission, Jesus proclaims a new society and fixes its foundations. Before him, nations were the possession of one or several masters, and belonged to these like so many herds. Everywhere, the tyrannical dom uh, domination of a few, and the serv uh, servitude of the rest oppressed uh, in the name of force or under the insolent pretext, uh, pretext of superiority of nature." Princes and grandes crushed the world with all the weight of their pride and their rap and their rapacity. Then Jesus came to put an end to this extreme disorder. He comes to lift the bowed down heads to emanci emancipate these multitudes of slaves. He teaches them that equal before God, men are free in regard to each other; that no one has any intrinsic power over his brother; that equality and liberty, these divine laws of the human race, are inviolable. That power henceforth can no longer be regarded as right, that it must depend on the association which delegates to it a function, a service, a devotion, a kind of slavery accepted by love and view of the welfare of all. Such is the society which Jesus demands his disciples to establish amongst themselves. Uh, end quote. And again, the same, the, as, as I was just talking about, um, the interconnectedness of, of uh, you know, this divine law, natural law, and freedom. Uh, on page uh, 60, uh, 69. Quote, those who should teach the truth, the divine law to the people uh, are unwilling to do so because they fear that people will forsake them. And why? Because if the divine law is taught to the people, they will thereby learn that to obey the law makes men free. And again, law with capital L. But they will also learn that individual responsibility is incurred by freedom. They must be taught that it is action which brings about results. That without a wrong action, there can be no wrong result. No longer can they be taught that life is a matter of mere formal faith, that immortality and eternal life can be had through mere verbal faith, but they must learn that the only price for which immortality of soul can be bought is right thought, right desire, and right action. End quote. So again, internal, external consistency. 
uh, it's uh, we've talked about it's something I've talked about. You know, the hypocrisy is something we we've we've all pointed out time and time again is just this rampant rampant uh, hypocrisy um, that people claim to have these values, um, especially especially uh, you know the, those uh, you know fascist conservatives, right? You know, they claim to be for the free market, but every single action they every single action they've taken um, is against that, right? Um, <laughs> most ninety nine percent of the actions. Or even, um, I guess, on a, on, a, on a more positive, uh, I guess, a more positive example, uh, something like, uh, oh, I don't know, uh, like consider, uh, uh, you know, consider uh, police, uh, you know, so-called bludgy accountability organizations um, that aren't operating with uh, with all of the inf- all of the all of the available information. Well, if you don't have all the available information, um, or or what's available at that time, uh, then your actions are, are going to be flawed. Uh, the solutions that you advocate for um, aren't going to be worthwhile uh so the the same the same sort of uh same sort of thing here is that uh you know the 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 emotions and the thoughts uh you know uh, um you know they might be uh they might be like uh the emotions might be eliciting a uh um empathy for a, a, a victim of bludgy brutality or something right but then the uh, the action that's advocated is uh, you know body cams or or something non consequential like that uh, where the the action taken isn't going to actually resolve or remedy the problem that they're trying to solve uh, so that's just the the, the general I mean uh, it's it's a very general basic uh, basic uh, ill of society again I think it's an important point internal and external consistency all right just jumping forward a, a minute and I haven't mentioned I haven't really brought this up yet. Uh, but Matthew chapter seven verse twelve. Therefore, all things whatsoever ye would that men should do to you, do ye even uh, even so to them. So yeah, the golden rule, right? Uh, the golden rule. Uh, and before I uh, uh, obviously I, I'd always I'd always understood the relation uh, between the golden rule and the non-aggression principle. I'd utilize it against uh, utilize it against Christians. It's a bad way to put it. But yeah, I mean it's again as I was referring to in the introduction, like these principles are so so damn basic. That they're taught to they're taught to school age school age children. It's just um, the servile society um, obfuscates things so so much, uh, and obviously confused confu- the confusion is what allows for the fear. So um, it's uh, something anarchists have discussed. There's there's two realms of uh, two realms of morality, two realms of ethics, and uh, and the political realm is just entirely divorced uh, from from everyday life. Somehow. Um, Somehow people can, you know, go through these these crazy, crazy rituals of, of compartmentalization. Um, yeah, mind control's a, a bitch, right? Mind control's definitely a bitch. So, uh, jumping forward to the next page, uh, seventy-five, same theme. Uh, this one principle: do unto others as you would uh, you would uh, that they should do unto you is the greatest of all. It includes all the commandments and is the basis of true undefiled religion. There is nothing greater than this. Same uh, same line of thought. The uh, Hebraic law taught the same truth. And a parchment believed to have been the first inscribed some 2,500 years ago is to be found. Quote, whatsoever you do not wish your neighbor to do to you, do not do not that to him. Appended to it was the statement, this is the whole law. The rest is mere exposition of it. End quote. <laughs> Seriously, um, it's it's crazy. Like, it's it's just like, hum- it's like being a being a human 101, right? Like, it's it's so basic. It is so basic. It's volunteerism 101, right? Like non-aggression principle. You learn that you you learn that in your first day of you know volunteerism kindergarten. Um, being sarcastic, obviously, but like that, it's it's that basic. And if that one thing was followed, yeah. Anyway, if if um, that's why we're building second realms, right? So that we can live according to these natural and cosmic laws. Um, but let me uh, continue. We're, I'm almost through uh, the mystical teachings of the masters. Uh, probably only a couple couple few more quotes, uh, and then uh, we'll we'll kind of summarize and move forward here. All right, and the uh, author continues with this same theme, quote, such is the law of God about acting towards others as one wishes that others should act, uh, should act towards oneself. Um, the next iteration of this, quote, the principle of true religion is clearly expressed in the gospel by the words, do unto others as thou wouldst wish that others would do unto thee. This is the whole law and the prophets. If this principle are recognized as the chief religious principle by all men, then egotism, which is the readiness to sacrifice one's neighbor's welfare to attain one's own end, would disappear of itself so that i recognize as what as so that i recognize as the cause of evil in general and of wars in particular solely the ignorance of true religion same same principle explicated in a different way uh let's see oh exactly oh another uh 
just another quote. Seems like it could. Be, it seems like it was written by a by a new an anarchist. But uh, let's see. Uh, quote: The only solution of the social problem for rational beings gifted with the capacity of uh, capacity to love consists in the abolition of force and in the organization of a society founded on mutual respect and rational principles voluntarily accepted by all. Such a condition can be obtained only by the development of true religion. By this term, I refer to the fundamental principles of all religions, which are. First, the consciousness of the divine essence of the human soul, and secondly, regard for its manifestation. Uh, ye are the sons of God. All right, this next quote, I just want to read this. Uh, it's very, very short because um, uh, the, the way that uh, the author, I guess, the way that the author and also the uh, the person cited um, quotes religion is basically sounds like a sounds like a principle, um, like a guiding principle, like a, like the non aggression principle. Quote: Religion is the relation of man to the external life, to God, in accordance with reason and knowledge, which moves man forward towards the end for which he was intended. Uh, end quote. Yeah, just like with uh, with you know well, with non aggression, um, you know we we strive to create this uh, this free and peaceful society by the utilization of those principles. It's, uh, um, I don't know if, if we were looking at a Venn diagram, I don't think there would really be any, anything on the outer, outer, uh, circles. Um, very few at least. All right. And, uh, as we, as we begin to wrap up here, um, page uh, 95, just the, the, the last, uh, last couple, uh, paragraphs on this page, uh, quote, the beginning of true life is in love. Unless we love the truth, we will not seek for the truth. Unless we seek it, we will not find it. If we do not find it, we cannot live it. The beginning of all things, whether of good or of evil, is in love. Love for the pleasures of the flesh will lead us into doing those things which will gratify the unhallowed love of the flesh, and therein is death. Love of the truth will lead to do, lead us to do the things that will give us truth, and therein do we find life. Love is therefore at the foundation of all things. It is the beginning of life, as it is also the beginning of death. I don't know. It's uh, I, I think it's yeah, it's it's it's, it's that, that seeking a, a lot of us uh, you know co- have come to. Uh, you know, the realm of self-liberation. We came here, you know, by way of a search for truth. Um, say the vast majority, uh, the vast majority did. Um, so I know I, I appreciate, uh, appreciate that, uh, that focus. Um, because yeah, the servile society, I mean, obviously, <laughs> obviously I, I've said it before and, and, and really like just the, just my personal acknowledgement of, of how strong the deception was at the beginning of this year is what kind of led me to, um, to this this text it was uh you know i guess uh one of the events in a long line of events but uh yeah it was the seeking of truth um that led me to this text and and then also same same with uh same with to, to anarchy and solutions as well uh, and i'm sure it was the same for for a lot of you so truth is definitely important um and the the deception that, that again that that confusion that confusion and obfuscation is why the servile society why those who falsely imagine themselves to be our rulers why they get away with all the shit that they do um, is because people are confused the, if if they if they really knew what was going on if they were told the truth about it which they are they just don't believe it um, <laughs> yeah yeah anyway all right uh, page one hundred three here uh, and again something anarchists have said for, for for some time right so quote we do have we, we have no right to judge our fellow our, our fellow men harshly for we do not know what cause they may have for their actions that's praxeology right um, <laughs> you know don't 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 judge the action it's uh, yeah don't uh, don't judge the action itself just uh, I guess at the fulfillment of the ends I think is is what, what Mises said it's been a while since I read human action but. It is ours to forgive, it is not ours to judge. No man has a right to hold the acts of another in judgment, even when his acts are clearly wrong. The action of a man is only between himself and his God, unless he interfere, interferes with the liberties of others. In such a case, a protective, me- a protective methods must be taken by society. So, gosh, uh, you know, if someone violates person and property, then yeah, defensive acts should be taken. Of course. Um, of course. And I love that that's clearly, clearly explicated. All right, lastly, um, from the Son of God. And, uh, yeah, again, just so harkens to what we're, what's, uh, you know, what, I guess what I see, um, going on in society and why, I, like, uh, I, obviously why I started pulling away from the servile society years ago and now why, uh, it's, uh, only getting, uh, only getting more radical. Quote, the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees. What was it? The scribes and Pharisees were devoted members of the synagogue. They were faithful in their attendance at the services. They dressed well. They glorified the personality. They upheld the written law. In most cases, the law was man-made. It was in harmony with things man considered right. Being men who lived uh, the carnal life, the life that is ruled by the flesh, they did not understand the divine law. Such were the Pharisees. They knew nothing of God because the personality, being of the earth, cannot know God. 
Men who are like the scribes and the Pharisees are denied the kingdom of God. Instead of giving service to God with his words, man must give service to God through his acts. Instead of fine clothing, he must perform fine deeds, and therefore erect a fine temple. Instead of glorifying the personality, man must transmute, change the personality into the individuality. He must know that the divine law, he must know the divine law, and above all else, he must make deliberate efforts to live in harmony with the divine natural law, and to reach the state called soul consciousness, or oneness, with the Father. Not merely through faith and faithful attendance upon a church is sonship possible, but only through obedience to the divine, again, I'm going to enter, enter it myself, divine natural law, one can become, uh, can become uh, the son of God. So as I uh, wrap up this first section, now let's talk a little bit about uh, key takeaways from uh, from this first text. And again, I want to emphasize that none of these really have any bearing on your own individual religious or spiritual beliefs. Um, but yeah, first off, as Vanuwen see the problem of the servile society as coercion, as I wrote about it in my book, Volume of Strategy for Self-Liberation, um, the Essene would view the main problem as force, as uh, violence uh, against nature. Secondly, uh, the building of parallel societies is necessary, so the fulfillment of natural law can be achieved, uh, and also uh, so the individual can live in accordance um, with said law and uh, live a principled life. And uh, lastly, I think, uh, at least for, for right now, um, and I'll, I'll mention it again, I've mentioned it probably a hundred times over the past three or four years, and uh, I'll mention it again, but uh, yeah, the important necessary duality between theory and practice, um, or as Passio and these, uh, these so-called teachers would say, um, internal and external consistency between thought, emotion, and action. Um, yeah, just very, very, very important. All right, so this next section I'd like to, uh, to touch upon, uh, as I said in the introduction, is... Uh, the uh, book, The Teachings of the Essene from Enoch to the Dead Sea Scrolls, uh, again by Edmund Bordeaux-Sizikli, um, and uh, he is a part of the International Biogenic Society. Uh, and I'll start with just the dedication, uh, and this is uh, um, yeah, excerpts from uh, from his book, which uh, looks like it's available on Amazon, but I just uh, went to uh, it's on a, uh, scene.com as well, uh, if you'd like to, uh, to take a look at it, and I'll put all those links uh, in the show notes. But the uh, dedication, which I really really, really love, um, to all those who perceive that peace for the whole depends upon the effort of the individual. Um, so automatically from the very start, the importance of individual action. Uh, so for Austrian, you know, the folks from, you know, Austrian, um, economics, uh, angle, uh, or just self-liberation. I mean, that should just, uh, should, should be a very, very good start. Um, so for some history, uh, and I see no better, um, way for this history, uh, than, uh, the introduction to this book. Uh, so that's what I will, uh, read real briefly. Quote, the several chapters of this book are compiled from material antedating the findings of the Dead Sea Scrolls in 1947. During the 20 preceding years, 1927 to 1947, I wrote and published a number of books on the Essene based on certain historical sources, such as the works of Josephus Flavius, Philo, and Plinius, and on manuscripts in the Library of the Vatican, the Library of the Habsburgs in Vienna, and the Library of the British Museum. In these books, I concentrated on the Essene traditions, which I consider of great practical value for modern man. When the first discoveries at Qumram became public and many persons urged me to publish an interpretation of these new findings, I decided to do so in two volumes. This first volume condenses the quintessence of the Essene traditions from pre-Qumram sources. The second volume will deal exclusively with the new discoveries. The present work is concerned with the meaning of the Essene traditions in relation to their values for mankind today and the actual practices which result in an expansion of consciousness. These values may be considered from four standpoints. One, the Essene traditions represent a synthesis of, great con of the great contributions to humanity of the different cultures of antiquity. They represent for us a path leading away from the one-sided utilitarian technology of contemporary civilization, a valid and practical teaching utilizing all the sources of energy, harmony, and knowledge everywhere surrounding us. They give us permanent standards in an age where truth seems to dissolve in a continual shifting of concepts. And lastly, this resulting neurosis and insecurity is given a complete balance and harmony through the Essene teachings. It is noteworthy that in this book, the meaning of the Dead Sea Scrolls, a Powell Davies, a Powell Davies says of the Essene, the Christian church and its organization, its sacraments, its teaching, and its literature is related to and in its early stages may have been identical with the new covenanters, covenanters who were known as Essene, some of whom wrote the Dead Sea Scrolls. Likewise, significant in the pre-Cumrum traditions of the Essene is the existence of certain Zoroastrian elements, a fact which I had previously maintained, in which Arnold, Arnold Toynbee has also pointed out in a recent writing. They bear a similar correlation to later teachings like those of the Kabbalah and Freemasonry, 
so yeah, I will... Uh... All right, and so we'll cover a little more of uh, the history of this scene here, but I think it's just it's just, it's just a very, very good um, introduction and uh, kind of overview um, that, will not, that will mesh nicely with what we've, uh, what we've already covered. Uh, quote, the Essene lived on the shores of lakes and rivers away from cities and towns and practiced a communal way of life. Um, they were mainly agriculturist, agriculturalists and arbor, arbor, arboriculturalists, having a vast knowledge of crops, soil, and climatic conditions, which enabled them to grow a great variety of fruits and vegetables in comparatively desert areas and with a minimum of labor. They had no servants or slaves and were said to have been the first people to condemn, condemn slavery both in theory and in practice. There were, no, there, were, uh, there were no rich and no poor amongst them, both conditions being considered by them as deviations from the law. They established their own economic system based wholly on the law and showed that all man's food and material needs can be attained without struggle through knowledge of the law. They spent much time in study of both ancient writings and special branches of learning, such as education, healing, and astronomy. They were said to be the heirs of Chaldean and per Persian astronomy and Egyptian arts of healing. They were adept in prophecy for which they prepared by prolonged fasting and the use of plants and herbs for healing men. A man and beast, they were likewise proficient. They lived a simple, regular life, rising each day before sunrise to study and commune with the forces of nature, bathing in cold water as a ritual and donning white garments. After their daily labor in the fields and vineyards, they partook of their meals in silence, proceeding uh, and ending it with prayer. They were entirely vegetarian in their eating and never touched flesh foods nor fermented liquids. Their evenings were devoted to study and communion with the heavenly forces. Uh, evening was the beginning of their day, and their Sabbath, or holy day, began on Friday evening, the first day of the week. Uh, this day was given to study, discussion, the entertaining of visitors, and playing certain musical instruments, replicas of which have been found. Their way of life enabled them to live to advanced ages of 120 years or more, and they are said to have marvelous strength and endurance. In all their activities, they expressed creative love. They sent out their healers. Uh, they sent out healers and teachers from the brotherhoods, amongst whom, amongst whom were Elijah, John the Baptist, John the Beloved, and the great deceased Master Jesus. Membership in the brotherhood was attainable only after a probationary period of a year and three years of initiatory work, followed by seven more years before being given the full inner of teach the, the full inner teaching. Records of the Essene way of life have come down to us from writings of their contemporaries, Pliny the Roman naturalist, Philo the Alexandrian philosopher, Josephus the Jewish historian and soldier, Solanius, and others spoke of them variously as a race by themselves, more remarkable than any other in the world, the oldest of the initiates receiving their teaching from Central Asia, teaching perpetuated throughout an immense, through an immense space of ages, constant and unalterable holiness." You skip forward uh, just a, a little bit here. Uh, echoes of the teaching exist today in many forms and rituals of the Masons and the seven-branch candlestick and the greeting, Peace be with you, used, by, used uh, from the time of Moses. From its antiqu antiquity, its persistence through the ages, it is evident the teaching could not have been the concept of any individual or any people, but is the interpretation by a succession of great teachers of the law of the universe, the basic law eternal and unchanging as the stars in their courses, the same now as two or 10,000 years ago and as applicable today as then. The teaching explains the law, and again, uh, law, capital L, uh, shows how man's deviations from it are the cause of all his troubles and gives the method by which he can find his way out of his dilemma. All right, so a little bit on the uh, on the book of Enoch here. Um, just, uh, um, so yeah, part of uh, the Dead Sea. So anyway, um, this is uh, Wikipedia, but it's a, a decent introduction and, and, and corresponds with uh, what I guess what, uh, what I've uh, read about it. But uh, the Book of Enoch is an ancient Hebrew apocalyptic religious text ascribed by tradition to Enoch, the great-grandfather of Noah. Um, Enoch contains unique material on the origins of demons and giants, why some angels fell from heaven, and an explanation of why the Genesis flood was morally necessary, and prophetic exposition of, these two th of the thousand-year reign of the Messiah. Um, the older sections, mainly in the Book of the Watchers of the text, are estimated to date from 300 to 200 B.C., and the latest part, Book of Parables, probably to 100 B.C., um, they were found in the Dead Sea Scrolls, as well as Koine Greek and Latin fragments. Um, and the, uh, yeah, so a short section of one Enoch is cited in the New Testament Epistle of Jude, uh, and is attributed there to Enoch the seventh from Adam. So, um, the, so yeah, uh, so yes, Enoch was a great grandfather of Noah, and Enoch was allegedly um, seven generations from Adam. What is a generation? I don't know what they mean by a generation. Maybe 120 years? Anyway, <laughs> um, the, the, that's that's kind of the, the, the background of the of the story, uh, or we have the Book of Enoch. Is that this is an apocalyptic text? It's supposed to be a couple generate, I guess, uh, before yeah, before the time of the Great Flood, um, and it kind of just walked through. Uh, you know, like as I said earlier on in this episode, it's uh, 
um, very much, uh, you know, a lot of the descriptions of society are, are, uh, are there's, there's certainly some correspondences, uh, to be sure, to be sure. So I started out uh, this episode, uh, the introduction, with uh, um, that, that second quote of uh, building second realms. You know, they, they, they built cities on, on shorelines away from – or they, they built societies on shorelines away from cities. Um, well, that was uh, an excerpt from this, from, from this text. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll get to, to that portion a little uh, – eventually, but uh, I want to cover – um, I guess uh, there, there's a little before that. So it's, it's just really, really interesting, and uh, I think it's, uh, it's, it's relevant. So um, let's uh, go ahead and begin. Quote, the third period of Moses' life, uh, the Exodus, began when he determined to dedicate the, the remainder of his days to the realization and application of the law and to bringing mankind into harmony with it. He recognized the enormity of the task before him in attempting to make both the ignorant masses and the arrogant rulers accept the law and live in harmony with it. Seemingly insurmountable obstacles confront all world reformers when pure idea meets the opposing force and the inertia of the human mind and the resistance of the entrenched power. It represents a revolution of the dynamic against the static, of higher values against pseudo-values, of freedom against slavery, and it is not limited to one time in history, nor to mankind as a whole, but occurs repeatedly in the life of individual man. Uh, jumping forward a little bit more... The three periods of Moses' life in which he discovered the law and its manifestations represent the three periods into which nearly every man's life can be divided. The first, Egypt, has been called the period of bondage, of the darkness of ignorance, when the free flow of vital energy is obstructed by ignorance and false values. Mankind's Egypt, his slavery, consists in the totality of his deviations from the law. The second period in Moses' life corresponds to the desert in an individual's life when his false values fall away and he, he sees nothing but emptiness ahead of him. It is in this period man most urgently needs inner guidance that he may find his way back to the light, the law, again, capital L, law. The third period, the exodus, is possible for every man. There is always the light showing the way to ex the exodus. Man's Egypt of bondage is never eternal. The exodus under Moses lasted 40 years, but it was only a beginning on the path of intuition, the path of learning to live in harmony with the laws of life, of nature, and the cosmos. And exodus for humanity can only be accomplished through the cumulative efforts of many people over many generations. All right, so I've skipped forward quite a bit. Um, this is the the most relevant portion to what we're going to be talking about here. And again, I will link the link uh, both of these uh, full texts in the show notes for free, uh, for free download. And uh, I do hope at some point to do an audio to record an audiobook for these. Um, I think they're important, and and, and they can. I, I I think they're important uh, anyway. So um, section four, peace with humanity. The fourth piece, fourth piece of the Essene referred to harmony between groups of people to social and economic peace. Mankind has never enjoyed social peace in any age in history. Man has always exploited man economically, oppressed him politically, suppressed him by military force. The Essene knew these injustices were caused by deviations from the law. The very same deviations that produce in harmony in man's personal life and his acting, thinking, and feeling bodies produce wealth and poverty, masters and slaves, social unrest. The Essene regarded both riches and poverty to be the result of deviations from the law. Great wealth, they considered, is concentrated into the hands of the few because of man's exploitation of man in one way or another. This has caused misery for both suppressor and suppressed. The many feel hatred and its kindred destructive emotions. This produces fear in the hearts of the exploiters, fear of revolt, fear of losing their possessions, even their lives. Poverty was held to be an equal deviation from the law. A man is poor because of wrong attitudes of thinking, feeling, and acting. He is ignorant of the law and fails to work with the law. The Essenes showed that there is an abundance for everyone of all that a man needs for his use and happiness. Limitations and overabundance are both artificial states, deviations from the law. They produce the vicious circle of fear and revolt, a permanent atmosphere of inharmony affecting the thinking, feeling, and acting bodies of both rich and poor, continually creating a state of unrest, war, and chaos. This has been the condition throughout recorded history. The rich and the poor alike suffer the consequences of their deviations. The Essene knew there was no escape from the circle of oppression, hatreds, and violence, wars, and revolutions, except through changing the ignorance of the individuals in the world. They, know it, they knew it takes a long time for an individual to change his ideas, thinking, and habits, and learn to cooperate with the law. The individual himself has to do the changing. Nobody else can do it for him. But a higher and higher understanding of the law can be brought about gradually, the Essene believed, through teaching and example. They taught a quite opposite way of existence from either poverty or great wealth. They demonstrate in their daily lives that if man lives according to the law, seeks to understand the law, and consciously cooperates with it, he will know no lack. 
He will be able to maintain an all-sided harmony in every act in thought and feeling, and he will find his every need fulfilled, end quote. So just to, to I guess, to draw another comparison for, um, for, for folks who may be getting lost in their religious um, you know, jargon. I mean, all we're talking about here is is cause and effect. Um, if uh, your actions uh, in in some way violate the the person or property of another, um, then yeah, you know that's something you could face the you could certainly face the effects of those actions, right? Um, if it's uh, in a violence uh, circumstance, you may uh, you may face uh, um, retributive force. Um, or uh, if uh, you know if it's kind of the uh, you know the the if you steal from somebody and and. They, no one knows who did it, then, uh, you know, maybe karma will come back and get you. Um, who knows? Um, <laughs> whether you believe in that concept or not is, uh, is, is up to you. Um, but, uh, but, yeah, it just comes down to, to, to cause and effect when deviations from, uh, you know, using coercion and force. Um, you know, those, uh, those had the, the, the effects of those um, are not good. Whereas the, the uh, effects of, um, you know, spreading freedom and autonomy and respect for person and property, um, those are uh, more expansive uh, sorts of ideas. Uh, but back to it. The solution which the Essene offered for economic and social harmony can be applied in every age, the present as well as the past. It contained four factors, uh, separating from the chaotic conditions of the mass of mankind, which refuses to obey natural and cosmic law. Two, demonstrating a practical social system based on natural and cosmic law. Three, communicating these ideas to the whole world, to the outside world, through teaching, healing, and helping others according to their needs, and four, attracting to their communities other individuals who are sufficiently evolved to be willing to cooperate <clears throat> with the law. The Essene withdrew from then harmony of cities and towns and formed brotherhoods on the shores of lakes and rivers where they could live and work in obedience with, to the law. They established their economic and social systems based wholly on the law. No rich and no poor were in their brotherhoods. No one had need of anything he did not have and no one had an excess of things he could not use. They considered one condition as deteriorating as the other. They demonstrated to humanity that man's daily bread, his food, and all his material needs can be acquired without struggle through knowledge of the law. Strict rules and regulations were unnecessary for all lived in accord with the law. Order, efficiency, and individual freedom existed side by side. The Essene were extremely practical as well as highly spiritual and intellectual. They took no part in politics and adhered to no political factions, knowing that neither political or military means could change man's chaotic condition. They showed by concrete example that exploitation and oppression of others were completely unnecessary. Many economic and social historians have considered the Essene the world's first social reformers on a comprehensive scale. Their brotherhoods were partly cooperative. Each member of the group had his own small house and a garden, large enough for him to grow whatever he especially desired. But he also took part in communal activities, whether his service might be, wherever his service might be needed, such as in the pasturing of animals, planting and harvesting of crops most economically grown, on an extensive basis. They had great agricultural proficiency, a thorough knowledge of plant life, soil, and climatic conditions. In comparatively desert areas, they produced a large variety of fruits and vegetables of the highest quality, and in such abundance, they periodically had a surplus to distribute to the needy. Their scientific knowledge was such that they could do all this in a comparatively few hours each day, leaving ample time for their studies and spiritual practices. Nature was their Bible. They considered gardening educational, a key to understanding, the uh, key to the understanding of the entire universe, revealing all its laws, even as does the acting body. They read and studied the great book of nature throughout their lives and all their brotherhoods as an inexhaustible source of knowledge, as well as of energy and harmony. When they dug in their gardens and tended their plantings, they held communion with the growing things, the trees, sun, soil, rain. From all of these forces, they received their education, their pleasure, and their recreation. One of the reasons for their great success was the attitude toward their work. They did not consider it as work, but as a means of studying the forces and laws of nature. It was this that their economic system differed from all others. The vegetables and fruits they produced were only the incidental results of their activities. Their real re reward was in the knowledge, harmony, and vitality they gained to enrich their lives. Gardening was a ritual with them. A great and impressive silence reigned as they worked in harmony with nature, creating veritable kingdoms of heaven in their brotherhoods. Their economic and social organization was only one phase of their whole system of life and teaching. It was considered a means to an end, not an end in itself. There was thus a dynamic unity and harmony in all their activity, their thoughts and feelings and deeds. All gave freely of their time and energy with no mathematical measuring of one, one another's contributions. Through this harmony within each individual, the individual's evolution progressed steadily. 
The Essene knew it takes many generations to affect changes in people or in mankind as a whole, but they sent out teachers and healers from their brotherhoods whose lives and accomplishments would manifest the truths they taught and little by little increase mankind's understanding and desire to live in accord with the law. The Essene Brotherhood at the Dead Sea for many centuries sent out such teachers as John the Baptist, Jesus, and John the Beloved. They warned again and again of the consequences of man's social and economic deviations from the law. Prophet after prophet was sent forth to warn of the dangers incurred by the social injustices that existed then, even as they exist today. Not only were individuals and groups warned, but it was shown that all who aided or in any way collaborated with the deviators were also in danger. The mass of mankind failed to listen, failed to gain any understanding of social and economic peace. Only the few more evolved individuals heeded. Of these, same, of these, some were selected to work in the brotherhoods as, as examples of peace and harmony in all aspects of existence. The Essene knew that through the cum cumulative effort of example in teaching the minority, who understand and obey the law, will someday grow through the generations to become, finally, the majority of mankind. Then and only then will mankind know this fourth piece of the Essene, peace with humanity. So yeah, I mean, you got a, a, pretty, a pretty good explanation of, uh, of, of how how, uh, you know, their societies existed um, alongside, uh, you know, these, uh, these first realms. Um, but again, the important thing here, and it's, it's just uh, certainly, certainly some overlaps here, right? I mean, um, I mean, they built a second realm in accordance with natural law, in accordance with non-aggression, in accordance with uh, the uh, anti-coercion principle of Ani. So um, I think it's pretty profound. I think it's uh, yeah, really, really profound. And uh, I know there's, uh, there's, there's probably some folks who, are, uh, who might be uh, recoiling at, uh, <laughs> at uh, you know, the, the, the commune comments or, or whatever. Well, they, uh, well, there was, uh, I guess, well, it was still more of a, a collective economic system. Um, the important thing is that that principle of non-aggression was, was foundational, um, that, uh, that anti coercion, the anti-force principle. Um, so I think that's a, a really, really great thing. And uh, don't have to agree with everything that they did, right? This is just one case study. Um, this is uh, just one case study, and I thought it was a very, very um, interesting endeavor. So I figured I'd share it. I suppose uh, probably probably one of the last uh, last sections I'll, I'll, I'll read an excerpt from here, and this is a part, uh, this is a piece with culture. Um, now I think it's just it's just an important uh, an important thing to consider um, as we build second realms. Uh, quote: Peace with culture refers to the utilization of the masterpieces of wisdom from all ages, including the present. The Essene held that man can take his rightful place in the universe only by absorbing all possible knowledge from the great teachings which have been given forth by masters of wisdom. Um, according to the Essene traditions, these masterpieces represented one third of all knowledge. They considered that there are three pathways to the finding of truth. Uh, one is the path of intuition, which was followed by the mystics and prophets. Another is the pathway of nature, that of the scientist. The third is the pathway of culture, that of great masterpieces of literature uh, and arts. Uh, end quote. So, um, yeah, just wanted to, to mention, you know, uh, there's there's a lot of, there's a lot that we can learn from um, from history uh, and apply to today. So um, they acknowledge that, um, which I mean, yeah, makes sense, right? Um, there's uh, there's certainly a lot to learn. No 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 need to uh, to reinvent the wheel. And then the other thing here is that. Um, the the uh, I guess the the acknowledgments of uh, of culture uh, you know masterpieces literature arts um, all those sorts of things which are critical to second realm uh, to to the second realm uh, to the development of that so that positive um, autonomous culture so to speak. All right, so I think that about wraps up the excerpts for today. Uh, um, so yeah, for for some today's episode will be only be further verification uh, that the second realm parallel society strategy is even more time tested and proven than even the committee of safety idea, which may be four hundred plus years old. Um, as the title of this episode states, ancient second realms. I think there's a lot of overlapping wisdom here. Uh, Rayo talked about the allure of the city, uh, of the city lights and how the servile society has its ways of drawing you back in. Uh, in the context of this episode, it would be Babylon's, for some, alluring temptation of materialism away and against nature. Either way you want to look at it, through the lens of Vani or spirituality, the objective has to be the minimization of time in that society. As many ties as can be cut need to be cut. But this isn't a new subject matter for us, obviously. Uh, if you haven't already, I'd highly recommend my recent conversation with Dr. John Apsley. Uh, we talked about his success in reversing chronic disease uh, by replicating the lifestyles of the long living, uh, many principles of which, uh, of which overlap with practices uh, of the Essene. And uh, 
Yeah, it's just removing ourselves from these influences of civilization. Um, it's it's the entire thing. Uh, it's 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 not how human beings are supposed to live. Um, but yeah, this is also closely related with my vision for the Free Republic of Pasnia, uh, pasnia.com. Uh, please do check out the Rebirth of Freedom ceremony that was just recently released. Uh, it's right there at the top of the page. And uh, I do hope so you'll uh, consider getting involved. Uh, all the information is right there at the website. Uh, I've said all I want to say right now on the subject, uh, but would recommend checking out the show notes for links to these full texts and uh, possibly some more resources too, uh, depending upon what I can get together. Uh, thanks so much for tuning in. Uh, until next time, Bonnie was years for the making. And now, a brief, relevant excerpt from a previous interview with Paul Rosenberg. I want to read just one one excerpt here from from your book, and then uh, and then we can talk about it because I, I I have not heard this this I guess this sort of uh, interpretation of um, of this, but uh, it's an interesting perspective on the biblical stories of Jesus's healing powers. Um, so you wrote, uh, quote, "What really stands out is Jesus's discovery of healing. This type of thing happened occasionally in Judea and elsewhere, but nothing like what Jesus did." He treated healing like it was a typical ability common to all men. He was introducing healing as a newly discovered ability that we all had, a human tool that he, uh, a human tool that he had newly figured out how to use. He would come into town and heal the sick people town after town after town. And the last thing that, that always bothered me, at least until I understood it, was that he refused to take credit for a lot of the healings. He would always say, your faith made you whole, and then he goes out of his way to prove that point. He sends out the, the 12 to do the same things he does. Then he sends out 70 to do the same thing he does, and they do those same things. They get the same results. That's if, it's as if he's saying to the entire nation of Israel, if I'm special, how are your children doing this? Uh, ellipses. Through all of this, he is trying to show that all men are capable of doing extraordinary things, that men have amazing abilities that they have not yet used. He believes deeply in the greatness of men and sets out to prove it to all who have eyes to see. End quote. So, I mean, that's pretty uh, pretty powerful because if you look at the – it's the modern interpretation of Christianity. It's that uh, you know he's kind of the 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 all powerful. He's you know one with God, and uh, you know we we can only strive to be like Jesus. We can't actually you know be Jesus. So I guess uh, do, do you want to speak to that? Sure. <laughs> um, I hadn't read that passage in a long time. Thank you. <laughs> um, but people over time in any any system of orthodoxy likes to make God very very high and humanity very, very low. They like that great gulf in between. Uh, for one thing, it makes it better if you're, you know, a, uh, a minister or a priest or whatever at some point, because you're necessary now. Uh, the other side, it makes it easy. You don't have to strive to be, to be great like the great man did. He was special. We're not going to be like him. You can relax. You don't have to try so hard. You don't have to grow. You can just be what you are. It's okay. Um, Jesus didn't teach most of the things that are attributed to him. Um, I, the virgin birth, never mentioned it, never said a word about it. Not once. The word Trinity never came out of Jesus' lips. No record of him ever saying such thing or even dealing with the concept. He said, my father, my father, my father. But he never said Trinity. He never said, I'm co-equal with God. He, none of these things did he ever say. And, and this idea of natural sin, that man is born into sin. And he never said that. Didn't say it. Other people said it. He didn't. Um, so people really conflate Jesus with Christian doctrine, which is a huge, huge error. Because it's he was entirely different. Um, there are things the most the most common thing Jesus said is something nobody even pays attention to. No one ever noticed, uh, so far as I can tell. Um, and it's that Jesus recreated the method of judging right and wrong. Uh, so far as I know, no one else has even talked about it. We're getting secret notes being passed in class here. <laughs> oh, that's fine. Thank you. Were Jesus powers lessons from ascended masters? I have no idea. No idea. Well, you know, did Jesus travel to, to India, for example, and do these things? No one knows. We don't know. We just have no idea. 
a best we can tell, he was, you know, the son of a construction worker in, in the north, in the north of uh, Judea, or actually north of Judea in Galilee. And he lived there and at 30 years old, he decided he had to go out and start teaching. But we just don't know. And who can say? I really don't know. I guess I ask because, do you mind? Yep. I guess I ask because um, his, Jesus's powers were very similar to what the Hindu religion uh, equates to what the yogis did, who reached, I guess, what Christians would call Christ consciousness. So um, my understanding is that he went off and took lessons from these ascended masters, these yogis, because obviously Hinduism was way predated Christianity and the, so yeah, and all of that, you know, Trinity and all that symbology came from other creation stories. It's entirely possible, but I have, n I've never seen anything real to, to put those together. I've never seen any evidence that, that put them together. Um, as best can be told. Now, now the story of Jesus is really solid. The, the, almost no modern scholar questions whether he existed. Um, people may have uh, different thoughts about what he did, what he said, what he believed. But as that he existed, there's just so much evidence now uh, that he did. And the evidence, there's more documentation of him than there are for of, uh, of Julius Caesar, for example. Uh, so there's there's all kinds of documentation, um, but the more I go through, you know, the original transcripts, the original old evidence, I don't see much that really contradicts the gospel accounts, and I don't see much that's solid at all uh, of anything else. There are a lot of could be's, but I don't see anything solid. I forgot, I forgot where we were before. <laughs> no problem, no problem. Because yeah, I, I guess there's uh, there's another I, I guess another guest too. Uh, and this is the one that uh, that Passio presented and um, they presented in uh, fake ass Christians again. That uh, kind of uh, <laughs> inflammatory title that uh, Jesus actually went to Egypt and you know studied the mystery schools and the occulted knowledge. So yeah, I mean it's especially when you're going back this far, it's hard to uh, really figure out, uh, you know, if there's, if there's just not evidence, if there's not evidence available, I mean, then fortunately there's, that's why I'm digitizing a lot of, uh, a lot of libertarian publications from the seventies and nineties so that they're accessible. They didn't really have that possibility back then. So, uh, so yeah, maybe they're hidden in the Vatican archives. I don't know, but uh, you know, I, that's something that's curious to me. You know, if, uh, if, if Jesus, you know, went to India or if he went to Egypt to, you know, study the mystery schools or the occult, um, I, I really don't know. Um, but it's just kind of a, a new realm that I'm, that I'm, I guess, investigating. But Well, that's a good question. Um, and as far as I can find and I can see, um, Jesus was born in whatever way. If, if we want to say, you know, it was providence you know, divine, whatever, or just like Mozart, just where did this kid come from? Um, Jesus was a better human being than the other people. And that's why he was killed. I mean, he, he was just better. And some people, the people who, who loved him and followed him wanted to learn. They want, they were, they were able to bear that. The ones that hated them weren't able to bear it. Uh, people who are noticeably better than others in some good way, they suffer for their virtues pretty strongly sometimes. Uh, had Jesus been born in any other place, he would have been killed too. It wasn't just there. It wasn't just the religious opinions of that place and time. Anybody would have found a way to kill him because this was a man who was noticeably better than other human beings. And people have this kind of sick status obsession. And if he's better in some way, that makes me worse. And they would have found a way to kill him anywhere because he was simply a better person. Wow. Yeah. That's, that's, that's interesting. And I, I, I don't know, I, I've, I've got to go back to kind of the, the, you know, the modern iteration of Christianity today. I mean, it's so, it's, it's mind blowing that, uh, 
you know, there's so much worship of the, the military and the, and, and the cops, the bludgies. Uh, it really is. And when you, when you raise the point, well, you know, to Christians, well, you know, get, who killed Jesus? Well, it was, uh, it was bludgies. It was the cops. Uh, so it's, 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 it's just really crazy to me that they can, you know, have these really, a lot of them have these really strong Christian beliefs that, you know, their families have had for a long time. Yet, uh, you know, the, I guess their, their, uh, the symbol of their religion was killed by, you know, the agents that they support, um, obviously, you know, a long time ago, but it's just really, it's, it's, I guess maybe I'm lucky because I started, you know, looking into this stuff, you know, about five years ago. Uh, so I never really had, you know, this long period of time where I was, you know, my I, my head was full of contradictions. So I have a hard time understanding how people can can hold both of those positions simultaneously when they're so opposite of each other and they're so antithetical to what they're claiming. So I don't know if you if you want to speak to that. Well, what happens is is people, uh, first of all, a lot of them are raised that way, and they come to see the world in that way and they kind of form their decisions and their mental universe around it. And the contradictions, they kind of blank them out to use an Ayn Randian term, but they do. And they kind of blank them out and they don't think about it. Or if they're very clever, they find a way to harmonize the two. And then they kind of become an important person in their community because they dealt with this contradiction and limited it for everybody. Um, but it remains a problem. Jesus was, I mean, war and Jesus together. Are you kidding me? Uh, please. It's, 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 it's ludicrous. Uh, but people are stuck in this. And like I say, it's easy. If, if we're supporting our nation because it's a godly whatever, um, then you don't have to suffer for righteousness. You don't have to take a stand. You don't have to stand alone. You don't have to have people ridicule you. You get patted on your back all the way through life and you just hang out with your guys and, and you can pretend that you're okay, that you're spiritual and you're going to get the magic fix after you die and everything's going to be great. And so you find ways to not think about certain things. And one of the things you have to do is not see a lot of the things that Jesus said, but if the preacher who's got perfect hair and a perfect suit and got everybody saying what a great man he is and he says this and everybody agrees with it, it's very easy to go along with it. Um, so those kind of things happen every day. I, I'm really seeing glimmers of light from younger people who, who say, really? I, I had lunch with a young man not long ago who's saying, I'm still a Christian and I still believe in God, but I don't think all these other things are right. And I'm seeing a lot more of that. And I think that this uh, war church thing, I hope at least that it, it goes away because it's just to Jesus, I, I can guarantee you this would be a, a horrifying thing that in your name, we're sending armies around the world to kill people. You know, wow. When is enough enough? The government taxes, licenses, and restricts almost everything we do, and then they have the balls to act like we are unable to handle freedom. In revoked consent, we see what happens when technology, anger, and desire for freedom come in contact with government. Alternate currencies, the Vanu lifestyle, and a strong security culture, these all make regular people targets. Are you ready to revoke consent? Find out how freedom can triumph over totalitarianism in this libertarian and Vanu themed piece of fiction, Revoked Consent, authored by TVP listener Ian Minnelli. To pick up your copy today, just visit libertyunderattack.com forward slash revoked consent. Again, libertyunderattack.com forward slash revoked consent. And make sure to check out the rest of the books, audiobooks, and privacy products available from Liberty Under Attack Publications. Libertyunderattack.com. Share your story, find your freedom.